Today, it's great to chat with Dr. Robert Cialdini. Dr. Cialdini is the author of Influence and Persuasion and is recognized the foundational expert in the science of influence. His principles of persuasion have become a cornerstone for any organization serious about ethically and effectively increasing their influence. Dr. Cialdini has earned a global reputation for his ability to translate his scientific research into valuable and practical actions. He's a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today bestselling author with over 7 million copies sold in 44 different languages. He's the president and CEO of Influence at Work. As a popular keynote speaker, he also helps organizations in the U.S. and abroad. Robert, what an honor it is to chat with you today. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to our interaction, Scott. Well, you're, a, as you know, you're a legend in this field. And this book is, um, is, is such a seminal book. I remember reading it in, in grad school and, um, and savoring every single word of it. Why did you decide to update it? Well, you know, that, 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 there was a push and a pull there, to be honest. Uh, it, the previous version was still selling very well. And uh, there's that, if it ain't fixed, don't break it uh, idiom that I had to confront. But it's also the case that the, um, there was a quote that my grandfather used to favor when I was a kid, and it just seemed to me that it had a lot of relevance for my situation. And it, he used to say, if you want things to stay the same, things are going to have to change around here. Right? <laughs> and it just struck me that that's exactly the situation I was in. Things were going well, but if I wanted them to remain going well, I needed to align myself with the newest research in persuasion science that, that I hadn't uh, addressed in previous editions. And I even had a, a new universal principle of influence, I thought, that had, uh, had occurred uh, to me in the interim that I needed to talk about. And besides that, there were a lot of readers who had written back to me about the content of the book Influence, which has universal principles of influence that define each of the chapters. And they said, you know, your descriptions of the uh, of those concepts, of those principles, we get it and we see where they come from and how they work and why they work the way they do, but could you give us specific wordings that we could use to harness those principles, harness the power of them, unleash those principles in the situations that we're, we're dealing with? So this new edition has a lot more of the specifics of how we uh, trigger the power of those influences by what we say or do in a particular situation. Oh, great. That's great. So we'll, we'll get to that. But first, I wanted to just, um, just go over the original the, the original six. Do you mind telling me what the, the principles of uh, the six universal principles are of influence? And then we'll talk about the seventh one you added. Not at all. I think that's all together appropriate. The first one is the principle of reciprocation that says that by the way, in every human society, we are obligated to give back to others who have first given to us, right? Uh, we, just, we just are uh, obligated to do so by the socialization we have all undergone so that uh, we are taught from childhood, you must not take without giving in return, you must not take without giving in return. For those people who break that rule, we have very nasty names. We call them moochers or ingrates or takers. And nobody wants to be labeled like that. So people will go to great lengths to give back to those who have given to them. There was a, a study done in McDonald's restaurants in um, Colombia and uh, Brazil in South America. Uh, the researchers arranged for every family to come into the location and, and for the children to receive a balloon. Half of the families got that, the children got that balloon as the kids were leaving as a thank you to the family. The other half got the balloon as they came in. And those families bought 20% more food. Hmm. Not only that, Within that 20% more food, coffee orders went up by 25%. Hmm. 
So it wasn't just the gift to the children. The parents felt that anything you give to my child, you give to me. We'll get to that in that section called unity, where we, 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 we feel that about that those people inside our groups are essentially share our, our identity. You give to them and you've given to us. But I, I think it's in, instructive that the key was who went first the, the, the rule for reciprocity doesn't say you use the typical economic exchange model where you say to people, look, if you'll buy my product, uh, you'll use my service, uh, I promise you will get the best possible outcome over your experience. That means the other person has to go first. But reciprocity says you go first, you give first, and then people want to give back to you. Second principle I love is that. Well, Changing yeah. the script there, Bob. <laughs> yes, like and it. uh, it's it's not just uh, that McDonald's fails to do it uh, properly in this particular study. How many times have you been in, in a restaurant where, as you leave on the desk, the registration desk, there's a bowl of mints for you to take as you leave? There's a study that shows that if the way instead of doing it that way. If the waiter puts a mint on the tray for each of the diners, his tip goes up 3.3%. If he puts two mints on the tray for each of the diners, his or her tip goes up 14%. Wow. So all in keeping with the rule for reciprocity, you just have to do it right. You know, I say to people, when you go into a room and you want to be influential, the first question you should ask yourself is not, hmm, who can help me here? It is, whom can I help here? That arranges for those people to want to help you when you need it. It's just a good nice. system that, in fact, uh, most societies are based on. Nice, so that's, nice. that's reciprocation. Okay, that, okay, that's number one. Yeah, number two is liking. Nobody in your audience would be surprised to know that we prefer to say yes to those we like. Um, what's interesting, though, is that there are two small things that are available for us to do to greatly enhance the rapport that people feel with us. One is to point to genuine similarities that exist uh, uh, between us because people like those who are like them. The other is to point to genuine, um, commendable aspects. In other words, to compliment people in some sort of uh, warranted way for what they've done or who they are. And uh, that, I have to admit to something, my greatest weakness, greatest weakness. I can't tell you how many times, you know, maybe you've had this experience. I've been in a research meeting with my graduate students, and I hear myself say, gee, what Scott just said there was brilliant. Mm. And I say it to myself. Hmm. And I miss all of the goodwill that would come from moving it from my mind to my tongue. So I scrupulously avoid that mistake now. And the results have been really outstanding. I mean, it's just the, 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 the goodwill and, and the, the exchange, the, the, the welcomingness of having people give those kinds of um, uh, comments uh, is, is established. And we all like each other better. <laughs> uh, uh, Great point, Bob. I got it out of my tongue. <laughs> um, as, as opposed to keeping it in my head. No, great, great point. Excellent. I love loved what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> next, the next principle is um, what we call social proof. The idea that one way we decide what we should do in a situation is not proof that comes from some empirical or logical uh, information that we've received. It comes from social information. What are the people around us, like us, doing in this situation that allows me to reduce my uncertainty about what I should do in this situation. 
Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, a study done in Beijing shows you the cross-cultural reach of this. Uh, restaurant managers at one string of restaurants uh, in, in, in China put a little asterisk next to certain items on their menu, uh, and each one immediately became um, 13 to 20 percent, depending on the item, more likely to be purchased. So what did the asterisk stand for? It wasn't what we normally see, which is this is a specialty of the house, or this is the chef's selection for this evening. It was, this is one of our most popular items. And each became 13 to 20% more popular for its popularity. Right? So one way as a communicator of genuine information that we can give to other people is to say, we have a lot of popularity for what we are doing and sh give them examples of that or percentages or market share or uh, 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 this sort of thing. And that always is uh, an easy way for people to, to take the shortcut to yes. Oh, okay, then I don't have to continue to calibrate and, 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 and and uh, think about the pros and cons of this, the majority of people like me like it, so that's a shortcut to yes. But there's some new research now. I, I, my team is responsible for some of it. That takes the principle of social proof to an, another level. And uh, it is that suppose you have a startup or you have a new product or service or an idea, a new initiative you would like people to, to uh, join you in. But because it's new, you, don't you can't point to social proof. The, the, the social proof is minimal. I mean, it's actually negative. Not a lot of people are doing it. Is there anything you can do under those circumstances? It turns out it, 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 there is. Even if you don't have, even if you only have a minority or a small minority of people who have uh, adopted it, because it's a good idea, you have to have a good idea. But if it's a good idea, you get to show a trend to that minority position. If it's only 20% of the market that's interested in, if you just say 20%, that's a statistic. If you said, Six months ago, it was 10%. That's a difference. And that's much better. But if you say six months ago, it was 10%, three months ago, it was 15%. This month, it's 20%. The same 20% is the end point of a trend. And people project the function of a trend into the future so that for the first time you have the leverage of something we didn't know the label of before, future social proof. In the research that we did it showed that if you give people a trend to 20%, they are more likely to say yes to it, right? Because they expect in the future it will be more than 20%. If Makes you've sense. got a good idea with that kind of uh, ability to move uh, people upward in a trend, you'd be a fool of the influence process not to honestly give them three data points. One data point is a statistic. Two data points, a difference. Three data points, a trend. Next principle also helps you. You're on a roll. You're on fire. <laughs> ah, you know, <laughs> Scott, yeah. I love this stuff. I all can tell. Life, all my life, I, I've been curious about uh, human behavior. And yeah. I have a job. We have a job where the, the, the job is to find out what we're curious about, to find out, the, the, to solve the things we're interested in and curious about. What a job. 
Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the eight-week online Transcend course is back. This iteration of the course, which will run from September 5th to October 24th of this year, will use science to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will be limited slots available, so save your spot as soon as possible. In addition to the regular class pricing, we're also offering limited slots for personal self-actualization coaching. Save your spot today by going to transcendcourse.com. That's transcendcourse.com. The Transcend Course is just one of the offerings of the brand new Center for the Science of Human Potential. The Center for the Science of Human Potential's mission is to use science to help each person fulfill their highest potential and contribute to the good of society. Toward that goal, we offer classes, coaching, and consulting opportunities to help people apply the latest science to help themselves, their organizations, their schools, their families, and their communities to be more creative, loving, and full of transcendent possibilities. For more on the center, you can go to scienceofhumanpotential.com. Hey everyone, doing this podcast for y'all is one of my greatest privileges, but the cost of maintaining a professional production like this one really adds up. I'm grateful to today's sponsors who help fund the show, but if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. You'll get completely ad-free episodes all while directly supporting the show for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash psych podcast. How did you get it? Oh, what a job is right. But how did you get How did you get interested in this topic to begin with? Like, um, were you even fascinated with the idea of influence when you were like a little kid? Yes. Because, well, partially when I was a little kid, but also a little bit older when I recognized that I was a patsy. <laughs> I mm. was a pushover for the appeals of various salespeople or fundraisers, and I would find myself in unwanted possession of these things or giving to causes I hardly heard of. And it occurred to me that there must be something other than the merits of the case that got me to say yes. Because I didn't really want these things inherently. I didn't really want to give my money to this cause I didn't know anything about because of the features of it that had been that that it seemed to have it was because of the way the merits and the features were presented to me that made the difference there was a psychological dimension it had to do with the delivery system <laughs> uh, that was employed to give me the merits or the features and i was swept by those those yeah. things enthralled me and I remember thinking to myself, now that's, that's interesting. That's worth studying. And not just out of self-defense, right? But because I thought, well, a lot of people would be interested in that. So and they, yeah, that was really become, the beginnings. Your intuition was right. Okay, so where are we now? Are we, are we up to the fifth principle? Well, we, we, we're up to uh, the fourth principle, which is this authority that says, uh, another way people reduce uh, their uncertainty is to uh, is to make themselves available to information from authorities. And if yeah. a communicator provides that information, they significantly increase the likelihood that people will say yes to them. Some people ask me, "Well, how do I how do I amplify the principle of authority if if I've got uh, if I've got an authority voice who uh, is aligned with what I am suggesting, uh, is there a way to, well, there are two things. First, you make that authority testimonial first. Make it first so that that aura of expertise and authority uh, applies to everything you say after that. Don't put it, don't bury it in the body of your materials. The second thing is you enhance authority by multiplying it. It's clear research. If you have multiple experts taking a pos position, it's significantly more persuasive than a single expert. Too. So your job is to, is to marshal that information so that where it exists, honestly, if it truly exists, you get to use that multiplier. Next principle is commitment and consistency. People want to say yes to those things that are consistent with commitments they've already made. And 
commitments in the form of what I've already said or done on a topic. And uh, so um, there's, a, there's a lot of research on this, but let me give you an example uh, that has worked very well for a, an acquaintance of mine who says that he was having trouble getting jobs. He would get into these job interviews and they wouldn't go especially well. Uh, but then he hit upon something that has gotten him three better jobs in a row, right? That he says at the start of an interview where he's in a room with an evaluator, sometimes a team of evaluators, and he always would say what we're trained to say, thank you for inviting me here. I, um, I very much want to uh, answer all of your questions. And then he says, but before we begin, I wonder if you could answer a question for me. Why did you invite me here today? What was it about my resume, about my background and experience that made you think I was a good candidate for the job? And he said, you will hear these people committing themselves to your strengths mm -hmm. and your candidacy out loud, actively, voluntarily. Right? Mm -hmm. And he said, <laughs> You, you now experience that not only have you heard the things that they consider the strongest elements that of your case, then you can embellish on those and zero in on those, but they've made a, a commitment to you. And he says three better jobs in a row. Okay, so that commitment and consistency. It's amazing uh, like how small things can have such big effects. You know, just uh, I'm amazed at all these things you're saying. They're just like... You know, like social psychology, uh, minor tweaks can cause huge uh, changes. It's amazing. Scott, that is a bullseye observation. How could this well, be? Thank you. Thank because you. we have, yes. I mean, I heard it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, out it and you got it out. Thank you. Yeah. We have this idea, the, the this uh, law of proportionality, where we think that in order to get big changes, we need to have big inputs. We, we need to make, you know, to, to have big outcomes, we need to have big changes, big steps that we take to produce those. Not if there are big motivational systems that we can simply trigger with a small word or deed of, of some sort. If, imagine uh, you're in a, a stadium and it's for a night event, a, a game or a concert or something like this, and you're in charge of lighting this stadium before the event. You don't go around to each one of these. You flick one switch and that minor amount of effort engages a powerful system that's already installed there in the in, in, in the stadium. That's how it is with these principles. Things like authority or social proof or, uh, you know, liking, those are big, big power sources inside of people. And all we have to do is activate them. We flip the switch that harnesses the power that they, that's already been installed there. So I think that's why it, it works. It, it's not that these strategies require a lot of muscle. They just require the knowledge of, of what, what already exists muscularly inside people's motive, motive systems. Yeah. Have any of these findings um, not replicated over the years? Because I know there was this big social psychology replication crisis. And I was wondering how your uh, the influence research has kind of stood with that. Yeah. So this is really a, a, a timely issue for us. Fortunately, in the book Influence, I don't talk about any single study that may or may not replicate because of some issues. You know, we don't even have to go with statistical power and all the kinds of things that uh, uh, may right. lead uh, uh, observers uh, astray. I talk about concepts wherein each concept of commitment and consistency or liking or 
authority. There are multiple studies that you couldn't claim were uh, uh, errors in some way. There are just too many of them, and they all cohere uh, in some sort of way that makes it more convincing, more compelling that, yeah, this is something that works. Uh, and here's the other side of it that I think uh, gives me some confidence that these principles uh, are major drivers of change. In order to uncover these principles, I got outside of my laboratory at the very beginning of my investigation and engaged in something called participant observation research, where I became something of a spy of sorts. And and infiltrated the training programs of various professions dedicated to getting others to say yes to them. Sales, marketing, advertising, recruiting, um, these kinds of things, fundraising. It was easy. They were just, they would put ads asking for, for recruits to be in there. And I would, and I would enter undercover disguised identity identity <laughs> that's funny and and what i looked for was the commonalities which were the things that they said worked for them across all of those different uh, 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 settings those different uh, arenas where people were getting others to say yes to them and whose livelihoods depend on it depended on it so they had to have beta tested these things in, in over trial and error. And there were just six of them. There were hundreds of individual tactics, practices, but I thought I could characterize, categorize the great majority of them in terms of these just these six categories, these six principles. So that helps me feel that the studies we're talking about uh, they reflect something uh, of the results of a much larger experiment than we could ever conduct sure. in the laboratory. Yeah. Or the, it, it's, it's what has proven to be successful for people whose, um, whose livelihoods depend on the success of the strategies. Right. It'd be, I'd be shocked to find out that it, that someday it turns out that it, that if, uh, if you don't like the person, that's better than if you like <laughs> right. the person, like, the, right. you know, that like it'll overturn that one, you know, or, you know, some of these seem like, yeah, well, there's a universal principle there. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of human nature. Um, okay. So what's, uh, what's the, are we on number six? Now? Well, well, we've got one last one and it, another what? one, you people, uh, your, 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 all your, your, your followers will uh, agree. Scarcity. People want more of those things they can have less of. And uh, one reason that is the case, I think, applies to uh, what Daniel Kahneman has won the Nobel Prize for demonstrating, and that is the power of loss aversion, uh, as opposed to, so that we are more, in his prospect theory, he says the prospects of losing something are more motivating to us than the prospects of gaining that same thing under conditions of risk and uncertainty. Not all the he time. Was, he, yeah. was, he was just on the podcast. Oh, he was. Yes. He that was. was a good get. I yeah. know. I got him and you. I can retire now. Yeah. yeah you know, I was on a, a at a conference where um, I was in the program the, to be interviewed uh, with uh, Richard Thaler and Daniel Kahneman and me, right? And I said to the interviewer, you know, I feel like I'm in a Nobel laureate sandwich and <laughs> I'm the lettuce. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's I, I mean, those are big hitters. Those are, those are big hitters. Uh, anyway, yeah. You're a so, pretty big hitter uh, too. Yeah. So he, thank you. But, but uh, what Kahneman says is there's lost... Aversion. Well, that's what scarcity, the basis of scarcity is you're, if something is scarce or rare or dwindling in availability, 
ability. You're afraid mm. that it will be lost to you. And so um, it, that's the reason people want those things uh, that have those characteristics. And uh, there was a study done of um, 6,700 e-commerce websites, and they looked at A-B tests within them to see which were the factors that if they included it or withdrew it, had the, made the biggest difference in uh, conversion from uh, prospect to customer. It was scarcity. Wow. It was scarcity. If you could honestly say that the, we have a limited number of these at this price or with these features or with this payment plan or whatever it was, um, you got significantly more uh, 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 conversions than any other feature. They looked at, at 29 of them. By the way, the next five were the other principles of influence. Nice. But scarcity was at the top of those principles, provided that it was scarcity of number, not scarcity of, not limited time. So it was a limited number of items rather than, oh, you can only get this for uh, one week. If you can get it for one week, that means you can decide to get it any time in that week. If it's a limited number and there's competition for it, therefore, you better move now. And that's the reason limited number is more successful than limited time offers. Yeah. Makes sense. So those are the original six principles. Yeah. Now, you added one that is very, very relevant to the world today. Um, it's the principle da, da, da. of... Yeah, please. I'm doing a drum roll. I'm doing a drum roll. Da, 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 da. And the seventh one is... Unity. And essentially, it's membership in a group that okay. you use to define your identity in some important, meaningful way. Um, and if, if a communicator can arrange for me to believe that this, this individual is one, one of us inside that group, inside that uh, category that I use to define myself, then I'm significantly more likely to say yes to that person because I, the research shows you trust those people inside your we groups more, you believe them more, you're more persuaded by them, you're more willing to cooperate with them, and you're more willing to comply with their requests. Right? So uh, there is a lovely study done on a college campus where researchers took a young woman who, college age, had her stand in a heavily trafficked area on campus and with a canister asking for donations to a legitimate charity. She was getting some contributions. But if she added one more sentence, she more than doubled contributions. And the sentence was, I'm a student here too. In other words, I'm one of you. Yeah, well, and this... all the barriers to uh, change came down. And she didn't say, I'm a student like you. We're not talking about similarity uh, in a broad kind of sense, or certainly not similarity of tastes or uh, style preferences or, uh, you know, these kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, inclinations. We're talking about commonality of membership in an existing meaningful group. What commentators are calling our tribes these days and tribalism you know yeah i mean it's so so obviously tied to tribalism and um you know there's a certain mentality going around of like well you can't understand possibly understand what i've been through because it's uh, my own that's personal right. experience that's um, right so how can we you're not like uh, me you're not of me that. yeah 
Yeah. And we, you know, people have asked me, well, how do we get to those people, let's say, who are resisting getting uh, a vaccine uh, for uh, COVID? Um, yeah. And uh, and it turns out there's a technique within um, persuasion science that allows us to get into their we group. And it's not just to have somebody who is similar to them in background or region, or, uh, but who, who can honestly say, I used to believe that too. And then I saw something happen or something happened to me. There was a new piece of information that entered the system and I changed, right? And the title of this is called the convert communicator. The hmm. person who has been converted from who you were in this very relevant way to something else based on a new piece of information. It makes it very difficult to dismiss that person. Oh, that's not me. That's not us. No, it was you, but there's something new that maybe you want to hear about and you're more open to hearing about it um, under those circumstances. Yeah. Oh, let's, let's just double click on this topic because it's just going to be, it's so important. Um, so uh, which types of recognized commonalities between different ethnic or racial groups lead to lasting reductions of prejudice and which only lead to very temporary reductions? Yeah. The temporary ones are the ones that get swept away uh, easily by the passage of time or new situations that e evolve. Um, where, but those that are the, are the more uh, durable are those that are aligned with evolutionary forces, right? And there are two of them that are powerful. Right? One is commonality of um, family right? and research indicating that we treat as family those individuals that we invite into the home and don't treat as guests even those from out, out groups, right? because there's good evidence that uh, children who view their parents treating out group members in the home as if they are family, then feel a family-like bond to those individuals. So one thing we can do as parents. If now this is a longer stage uh, approach, but if we want our children to view the species as the group, the meaningful social identity, if we want them to see humanity as the group, right? We should systematically invite into the home people from a variety of groups that are not our own, right? And, and, and here's the key that my mother would criticize me for if I... Can, if, I, if, can if, I guess it? Can I guess yes. what it is? Please. Don't treat them as though they're guests. That's exactly right. Yay! Ask them to help set the table. Ask them to help clean up, just mm. like you would a family member. And now your kids are seeing you treat them just like family, not like mm. somebody separate from us, mm. not from somebody that we do something different for. Right? So that's one of them. The other is something that is much more easily done, but it, it, it's, not, it, it's not easy to, uh, to undertake in the moment. Mm. But... There's research to show that we, we feel more bonded to the people who, that we share a region or community or neighborhood with. Right? Because, again, evolutionarily, we began uh, as a species in uh, evolved, once we evolved in small groups, tribes and clans. Uh, of, of one sort or another that 
we're barely more than 25 to 50 uh, individuals at a time. And those individuals typically shared our identity. They shared our genetic identity, right? And so what we find now is evidence that people give favor to those inside their region. There's even a term for it called um, localism, where you find, for example, that if you receive a request to participate in a survey from a university, you're significantly more likely to comply with that request if it's a university in your state. Mm -hmm. There was a study done uh, of people who reacted to a, a military death in Afghanistan, let's say Afghanistan, uh, uh, so a soldier, a U.S. soldier, military uh, personnel was killed. They became significantly more against the war in Afghanistan if that soldier was from their state. Right? Mm. So there's this regionalism uh, there. And I, I, I'm going to tell a story I haven't told in any of the interviews that I've done on this book because it is... Is it appropriate? It's, no, it's appropriate, but it's, it's a downer. Okay. Let's, let's hear it. During the, during the Second World War, we know what happened when Nazi forces would uh, command a, a region, a country, and so on. They would take the Jewish residents and put them in concentration camps, work camps, often death camps, and eliminate them. Well, there was, a, there was a practice, it really makes my skin crawl when I hear it, mm. that if any, in a work camp, if any one individual right, violated a rule, mm. everyone was lined up. Mm. And there was a guard who would go down the line counting to 10 and executing every 10th person. And the story was told to an anthropologist named Richard uh, Ronald Cohen, uh, by a former uh, Nazi guard who said he saw this happening again, as, as it often had, by the same guard who was the bloodless killer uh, in, in the past. And he came, he went one, two, three, four, five, ten, bang, one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, and he stopped, raised his eyebrows, made a half turn and executed the 11th. And afterwards, the second guard asked the killer, what, why did you not, why did you kill the 11th instead? Was it somebody you had noticed was especially a good worker or especially uh, able to um, <clears throat> do uh, the things that you wanted him to do? This guy laughed. He said, no, no. I recognize him. He was from my hometown. Wow. Okay. Wow. So the thing is, inside our neighborhoods, inside our communities, so what we should be willing to do is to relocate, not get out of your house and go, but when you are deciding on a neighborhood to move to for your next relocation, one of the factors should be how how many uh, how many outgroup members live there. That should be a plus for you. That's going to reduce our sense of unity as this small nuclear group to something much larger than that. That includes people from outside of our in groups. Yeah, that that was a really powerful story, by the way, and um, and you know, over generalized generalizing from those principles, I mean, has a lot of deep implications for um, the way we treat each other these days. People that we think are in our out group. Um, you talk in your book about uh, the role of threat in undermining favorability mm -hmm. and inciting hostility towards those outside of one's in group. Um, how, what what role does threat play there? 
threat causes us to pull in the boundaries of we. We become protective, self-protective, right? And so it turns out that the boundaries of our we groups are relatively elastic. We can extend them to include other people under certain sets of conditions. When, for example, we, uh, when there is no threat, when we've been successful, when the environment seems to be welcoming and reinforcing, we are emboldened to uh, allow a much larger tent to exist. But when things are threatening, then we become much more protective and, uh, const and constrict those boundaries uh, away and especially away from those individuals who um, are, are not of us. Uh, we, we start finding differentiations and reasons to put them outside of the, the tent. Uh, threat is uh, probably the biggest single uh, uh, motive for constricting our we groups. This is so valuable. Well, you know, your original book was incredibly timely, and this one is even more timely. I um, just want to say congratulations on um, this updated uh, version, but just a uh, huge uh, thanks for, for what you've contributed to the field of psychology throughout your whole, your whole uh, long and, uh, and, uh, and impactful and influential career. Influential <laughs> career, I well, should thank say. thank you. I appreciate hearing those kind words. Thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.